Welcome to the Human Reproductive System. The system is useful for human regeneration. First, I will talk about the male reproductive organs. There are penis, urethra, epididymis, testicle, prostate, seminal vesicle, and vas deferens. Uh, testes and epididymis. Testes are the organ that responsible for producing sperm. It is covered by two connective tissue, tunica vaginalis and tunica albuginea. And the organ above the testes is epididymis. It is useful for measuring sperm. It is made of pseudo stratified epithelium and covered by connective tissue. Next is penis and urethra. Penis is composed of nerve and erectile tissue. When the nerve gives impulse that causes the blood flow to the penis, the erectile tissue will trap the blood so that it creates pressure and cause the penis to erect. It will be enlarged and stiff. And the organ inside the penis is urethra. It is composed of epithelial tissue, connective tissue, and submucosa. This organ is useful for carrying semen and urine uh, out of the body. Next, vas deferens. Vas deferens is a duct that uh, responsible for sending semen or urine to urethra. It travels from epididymis to the back of the bladder. It is composed of three layers, the innermost layer made of pseudo-stratified columnar epithelial tissue, the middle layer made of connective tissue and visceral muscle, and the outermost layer made of adventitia. The two organs that responsible for producing fluid for the semen is prostate and seminal vesicle. Prostate produce fluid that keep the uh, keep the sperm healthy in in the female reproductive organs. And seminal vesicle produce fluid that uh, rich on fructose that useful for the energy source of the sperm. And the prostate composed of glandular tissue, the one that secret fluid, and covered by fibromuscular tissue, while the seminal vesicle uh, composed of three layer, the innermost layer made of mucosa and pseudo stratified epithelium, the middle layer made of muscle tissue, and the outermost layer made of connective tissue. Next, I will talking about female reproductive organs. The female reproductive organs is divided into internal and external. The external part is there is there are clitoris, labia minora, labia majora, and Bartholin's gland. While the internal female reproductive organs are vagina, uterus, oviduct, and ovaries. Clitoris. Clitoris is made of erectile tissue so that it can erect when there is blood flow to the clitoris and it has the largest amount of nerve endings than any other part of the body labia minora and majora is the gate that covered the female internal reproductive organs it is composed of connective tissue erectile tissue sebaceous gland and sensory nerve endings. The, the difference between labia minora and majora is that labia minora located in the inner part smaller and hairless while the labia majora is located in the outer part larger and hairy. Bartholin's gland. This gland made of columnar epithelia and the duct of the gland composed of stratified squamous epithelia and transitional epithelia. This gland is useful for producing mucus that will lubricate the vagina. Next, vagina. Vagina composed of mucosal tissue 
which is areolar connective tissue covered by simple columnar epithelia and muscle tissue with collagen and elastin fiber that makes the vagina elastic next uterus uterus made of three layer mucosa layer fibromuscular layer and serosa mucosa layer uh, is useful for facilitating the growth of embryo while the fibromuscular layer uh, is useful for induced uterine contraction next oviduct oviduct is composed of muscularis mucosa layer serosa and connective tissue this duct is important for the delivery of ovum from ovary to the uterus next ovary this organ is the one that producing of ovum it is it has the surface composed of single layer cuboidal epithelia and under the epithelial tissue there is mesothelium and under the mesothelium there is tunica albuginea it is divided into two part inner part and outer part the inner part is called medulla and the outer part called cortex and both of this medulla and cortex are made of connective tissue Gametogenesis is the process of forming the male and female gametes, which occurs in the gonads, which is ovary in female and testis in male. The process starts with a diploid cell, which goes through meiosis and cell differentiation, resulting in a haploid cell. Gametogenesis in male and female produces different gametes, but the principle is the same in both male and female. And we will talk about the similarities first before diving into the differences. Gametogenesis is divided into four phases. First, extragonadal origin of primordial germ cells. Primordial germ cells are highly specialized cells that are able to develop into a specific gamete. Second, proliferation of germ cells by mitosis. After they've arrived in the gonads, the Primordial germ cell undergoes rapid mitotic proliferation, which increases the number of primordial germ cells from hundreds to millions. Third, meiosis. And lastly, fourth, structural and functional maturation of the ova and spermatozoa. Oogenesis process goes to develop into a matured ovum, or for the plural form, ova. Oogenesis occurs in the outermost layer of the ovaries. As with sperm production, oogenesis starts with a germ cell, called oogonium, or for the plural form, oogonia. But this cell undergoes mitosis to increase in number, eventually resulting in up to 1 to 2 million cells in the embryo. Oogenesis is divided into two stages, primary oocyte and secondary oocyte. Now I'm going to explain the whole process of oogenesis. Oogenesis starts with oogonia. Oogonia is a diploid germ cell that has the potential to develop into ovum. It is created when a female is still a fetus. Fetus is a stage one or two months before birth. And also before birth, seven million had already died. Of these oogonia had already died. And the rest who survived enters the primary oocyte and starts meiosis 1, precisely in prophase 1. It is paused in this stage after they've replicated genomes, but before they've made meiotic divisions for over a decade, until the female hits puberty, and will continue for 30 up to 45 years on a monthly basis, also known as menstrual cycle, and will only pause in between if fertilization occurs. Primary oocyte will resume its meiotic cis when it is triggered by a hormone called LH and complete the first meiotic division. As we expect that it will be divided equally, in oogenesis, the division is unequal. Almost all the cytoplasm remains in the larger daughter cell and the smaller cell called the first polar body, which consists half chromosome and very little cytoplasm as you can see here. Polar body is 
not a functional oocyte such as the secondary oocyte that you see here. It will degenerate and dies eventually. Polar body allows the second the oocyte to reduce its genome by half and conserve most of its cytoplasm. As you can see here, see here, it still has two copies of each chromosome. It must still undergo the second meiotic division, and this division will also be uneven, the same as the the stage before. As you can see here, it is still uneven. This happens so that the ovum achieves its haploid state while conserving as much cytoplasm as possible. So now you know why oogenesis produces four cells but only one survives in the end. Furthermore, the de deployed secondary oocyte will become a a matured ovum when it is fertilized. Meiosis of a secondary oocyte is completed only if a sperm succeeds in penetrating its barriers. Meiosis too then resumes, producing one haploid ovum at the instant of fertilization by a haploid sperm. Becomes the first deployed cell of the new offspring, also known as the zygote. This the ovum can be thought of a brief transi transitional haploid stage between the deployed oocyte and the deployed zygote. A matured ovum will have two protection layers called the corona radiata and the zona pellucida, a plasma membrane encircling the circle, nucleus, and cytoplasm. Spermatogenesis is the process that spermatogonia undergoes to develop into a matured sperm. It is developed in the seminiferous tubules of the testes. The primordial sperm cells, also known as spermatogonia, stays from late fetal period until puberty. And at puberty, spermatogonia undergoes mitotic division, which results in the increase of genetically identical cells. This cell grows gradually into primary spermatocytes, and it is preparing to divide into two equal bodies. Each of these prim the primary spermatocytes undergo a first meiotic division that you can see there, first spermatocyte. And it forms two cells known as spermatocytes. Then it undergoes further process which is secondary spermatocyte that is the second meiotic division so it becomes full haploid cells known as spermato spermatids since this spermatids doesn't have the form or shape that enables them to move so they undergo a another process called spermio spermiogenesis which changes their form or shape transforming into the mature sperm cells. The spermatid nucleus transforms into acrosome and slowly grows its tail. And most of the cytoplasm sheds here. Then the sperm cell leaves the Sertoli cell lining of the tubules to the lumina and it is lastly stored in the epididymis so that it is functionally matured. So now we're going to talk about fertilization. So what is fertilization? Fertilization is the fusion of the sperm's nucleus with the ovum's nucleus to produce a zygote. Because each of these gametes is a haploid cell, which basically contain 23 chromosomes and is half of the genetic material required to form a zygote. Their combination produces a diploid cell, which is basically 46 chromosomes. And this diploid cell produced is known as a zygote. So there are three phases of fertilization that we're going to talk about in this video. First, the transit of sperm. Second, the contact between sperm and oocyte. And lastly, the zygote. Phase, phase 1. In order for a sperm to get the there are a series of obstacles that face. 
during sexual intercourse, for about 300 million of sperms or spermatozoas are released into the vagina, and instantly, millions of these sperms are overcome by the acidity of the vagina, which is approximately pH 3.8. Next, the sperm passes through the cervix, an opening into the uterus. Cervix here opens for a few days until ovulation is finished and it will be enclosed again. More are blocked from passing their cervix and entering the uterus by thick cervical mucus, which is already bent to ease the passage of the sperms. Here, some of these sperms are caught in the folds of the cervix, but it don't die. It is just caught, and it will act as a backup group for the first group. The first group here is the sperms which are able to continue their journey to the uterus. And for those who have successfully entered, thousands of them will be destroyed by phagocytic uterine leukocytes which mistaken these sperms as invaders. Next, half of these sperm heads to the empty fallopian tube and other half races into the uterine tube which contains the oocyte. Therefore, the competitors are reduced to a few thousand. Throughout this whole race, there is this process called capacitation. A sperm, or to be exact, spermatozoa, must undergo this process so that it is matured enough before it fuses with the oocyte. It is done by the fluid in the female reproductive tract. This fluid improves the ability of the spermatozoa to move so that it can swim harder and faster towards the oocyte. It also depletes cholesterol molecules embedded in the membrane of the head of the sperm, thinning the membrane to help facilitate the release of lysosomal enzymes that is required for the sperm to penetrate the oocyte's exterior once it made contact. Heading, 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 heading to, 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 in, ov in ovulation, inside, inside, inside the uterine tube or the fallopian tube, tiny silica pushes the or, 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 oocyte sacs to the uterus. And here, fertilization must occur in a distal uterine tube because an unfertilized oocyte cannot survive the 72 hours journey towards the uterus. So it is only heading to the uterus, but it'll not reach the uterus because it'll eventually die. As the oocyte that is pushed by tiny cilia moves along the distal uterine tube, the oocyte encounters the surviving capacitated sperm, which is streaming towards it in response to chemical attractants that is released by the cell of the corona radiata. Corona radiata is the protective outer layer of the oocyte. Here, some of the sperms gets trapped in the cilia and eventually dies. Sperm which has successfully reached the oocyte will have to penetrate the true protective layers encircling the oocyte. The most outer layer, corona radiata, is made up of follicular or granulosa cells that forms around a developing oocyte in the ovary and remains with it upon ovulation. And the second one, underlying zona pellucida, is a transparent yet thick glycoprotein membrane that surrounds the cell's plasma membrane so that it can get into the membrane of the oocyte. Now, the sperm must first pass through the corona radiata. It is only able to pass through corona radiata when it has already undergo a spontaneous acrosomal reaction, which is the digestive enzyme that is released by this reaction, which digests the extracellular matrix of the corona radiata. And not only one sperm works on this, but hundreds of sperms works together to degrade the corona radiata. And this will create a path that one winning sperm will use to contact and fuse with the plasma membrane of the oocyte later. Then, when it reaches the zona pellucida, the sperm binds into the receptor in the zona pellucida, and this acts as the start of a process called acrosomal reaction, which I've mentioned before, in which the stored digestive system inside the cap of the sperm is being released. These enzymes is used to clear the path, path through the zona pellucida so that the sperm is able to reach the oocyte. After that, a single sperm must get in 
that has already gets in contact with the sperm binding receptors in the oocyte plasma membrane. The plasma membrane of that sperm will then fuse with the oocyte's plasma membrane and the sperm's head and mid piece enters the oocyte. And when finally this one winning sperm reaches and fuses with the membrane, oocyte deploys two mechanisms to prevent polyspermy. It's either fast block or slow block, which is penetration by more than one sperm. This is critical because if more than one sperm were to fertilize the oocyte, the resulting zygote would be a triploid organism with three sets of chromosomes, and that is incompatible with life. In phase three, recall that oocyte has not finished its meiosis until fertilization occurs. So finally, oocyte is now a matured ovum and is a female haploid gamete. Now, the winning sperm that has entered the oocyte that has packed, tightly packed male genetic material spreads out and a new membrane forms around the genetic material cre creating a male pronucleus which has 23 chromosomes and the female genetic material is awakened by the fusion of sperm and egg completes dividing, resulting in female pronucleus which also have 23 chromosomes. The pronuclei are being pulled towards each other by the microtubules and their nuclear envelope disintegrate and the two sets then joins together. This step completes the whole process of fertilization. The product from the two sets that have been joined together is a unique genetic code that will determine gender, hair color, eye color, and basically make up, making up the whole characteristics of a zygote. Menstruation cycle is a cycle that occurs to release one matured oocyte from hundred thousands of primordial ogonia. It produces cyclical changes within the endometrium. In menstrual cycle, there are four phases, menstruation, follicular phase, ovulation, and luteal phase. The first day of menses represents the first day of the cycle. To start off, I'm going to talk about the two major phases, the follicular phase and the luteal phase. The follicular phase starts by the onset of menses and ends with the day before luteal and zinc hormone surges. Meanwhile, on the other hand, luteal phase starts on the 14th day and depends on luteal zinc surge and ends on the next menses. This cycle usually lasts for about 28 up to 35 days. Follicular phase usually lasts for about 14 up to 21 days, and it is changeable since luteal phase is always constantly 14 days, and cycle between one woman and another varies. Changes in estrogen and progesterone level cause the cyclical changes, and to, un to ease understanding, I'm going to simplify it into three stages, menstruation, follicular phase, and also luteal phase. So I'm going to start off with the menstrual cycle. This cycle lasts for about four up to five days. And this is where the functional layer of the fallopian tube is left off and discarded with the menses. Blood discharge from the vagina is combined with small pieces of the endometrial tissues. And the endometrium will get thinner afterwards. The blood discharge is usually 50 milliliters up to 70 milliliters and it is caused by sudden remove, sudden withdrawal of progesterone. And now we enter the follicular phase. This phase lasts for about 9 days and is mainly controlled by estrogen. This phase coincides with the growth of the ovarian follicles. And the wall of the endometrium will get 2 to 3 times bigger because the size doubles. And the gland increase in size and blood vessel elongates, elongates and spirals. Now we enter the luteal phase which lasts for about 14 days and it is fully controlled by the progesterone. Progesterone is released by corpus luteum 
Progesterone here stimulates the development of epithelium, which is rich in glycoprotein. As we all know, zola, zona pellucida is rich in glycoprotein, and the thickness of the endometrium increases by 5 up to 7 millimeters in this phase. Moreover, in follicular phase, the high level of follicles stimulates hormone and the level of estrogen rises. And during ovulation, ova release that ova is released, luteinizing zinc hormone peaks, and during luteal phase, progesterone increases. So, what happens if there's no fertilization? If there's no fertilization, corpus luteum will degenerate and forms as corpus alt Bicana. Estrogen and progesterone will fall, and the next menses cycle will repeat from the start. And if fertilization occurs, secretory phase is prologue, and endometrium is prepared for implementation of the embryo or the zygote. Next, I will be talking about contraceptive pills. These pills are useful for preventing pregnancy. These pills can either contain progesterone estrogen or both estrogen and progesterone how estrogen prevent pregnancy is that the increase of estrogen to a certain level will interrupt the production of FSH FSH is the hormone that stimul stimulate the maturation of ovum so when this hormone is interrupted this hormone production is interrupted it, the ovum will not be major and how progesterone uh, prevent pregnancy is the increase of progesterone to a certain level indicate pregnancy so when the body thought it was it is pregnant the body will have an abnormal menstrual cycle so it will prevent pregnancy. There are a number of diseases that affect the reproductive system. The organs making up the reproductive system is different in both genders. Thus, the diseases affecting them will also be different. In this video, I'm going to talk about the most common diseases, their symptoms and their treatment, which occurs in the reproductive system of a male and female. Fests and large prostate are also known as benign prostatic hyperplasia or BPH is a condition in which occurs in men as they grow older. The gland grows and causes urination difficulties, which is the symptoms. In some cases, it can also lead to infection, bladder stones, and reduced kidney function. Treatment consists of supportive care urinary retention medication which relaxes the bladder or shrinks the prostate surgery and minimally invasive surgeries. Second, prostate cancer or also known as prostatic carcinoma is when a cancer is encountered in a man's prostate, a small walnut-sized gland that produces seminal fluid which is responsible to nourish and transport sperm. Symptoms include difficulty with urinations, but sometimes there are no symptoms at all, which means it requires a medical diagnosis. Treatment varies because different types of prostate cancer grows in different lengths of time. Some requires only monitoring and some other ones requires some ag other aggressive ones requires radiation, surgery, hormone therapy, chemotherapy, and other treatments. Lesions that cause pain and inflammation. However, the lesions can also appear on your ovaries, fallopian tubes, and the lining of your pelvis. And in some cases, it can also affect your bladder, bowel, intestines, and rectum. Symptoms include painful periods with severe cramping known as dysmenorrhea and painful sexual intercourse. The treatment of endometriosis depends on how chronic and on what stage 
the endometriosis is on, but usually hormones and excision surgery are the ones available. You 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 free free is in a non cancerous growth in the US that, that, that can develop during women, women's childbearing years. There is no exact reasoning of why this disease exists. Risk factors include a family history of fibroids, obesity, or early onset of puberty. Symptoms include heavy menstrual bleeding, prolonged periods, and also pelvic pain. And in some other cases, there are no symptoms. Treatments include medication and removal of the fibroids. The fibroids can be everywhere in the reproduc female's reproductive organs. Pelvic injury disease. Endic disease is an inflammatory disorder of the upper female genital tract, including the uterus, fallopian tube, and adjacent pelvic structures. It usually occurs when sexually transmitted bacteria spreads from the vagina to the womb or the uterus, fallopian tube, or ovaries. Common symptoms include pelvic pain and fever. There may be Vagin vaginal discharge too. Treatment for this disease is antibiotic and penicillin.